Hi and welcome back to Jen's Jungle and this is part two of my complete Daegu care series Anatomy of a Daegu. Today we'll be discussing their scientific classification, close relatives and a more in-depth look at their anatomy. Today we're joined by my lovely large group of Daegus which is made up of 19 girls and two boys. These boys are of course neutered. <laughs> this might sound like a lot but Daegus naturally live in large groups. In the wild, they're known to live in groups of up to 100. So as a little overview, Daegus are small mammals. They're normally between 12 to 16 centimetres in length, with a 10 to 14 centimetre tail. On average, they weigh between 170 to 300 grams. They normally live around five to eight years in captivity. However, in the wild, they typically only live around a year, and this is mainly due to predation. They are born fully formed with full coats, can walk and suckle immediately after birth, open their eyes within a few hours, and really look like miniature adults. But they cannot firm or regulate, and only become fully grown at around 12 months. They are from central Chile, and are currently not endangered. They are semi fossil so adapt to live partially underground, but not completely. So let's start off talking about their scientific classification. So there are four different subspecies of daegu. The common daegu, Octagon dagus, the bridges daegu, Octodon bajagus, the moon tooth daegu, Octagon lunatus, and then Nokka island daegu, Octagon pacificus. It is a common daegu that has been domesticated and is currently kept in captivity and as pets. And it is the common daegu we'll be focusing on in this video. The scientific of the common daegu is as follows. They belong to the kingdom of Animalia, the phylum Trodata, the class Mammal, order Rodente, infraorder Histrocognatha, suborder Caphimorpha, family Octodontati, genus Octodon, species Dagus. So let's have a look at their close relatives. The Dagus belong to the Caphimorpha order and there are three other families within this order. These are the Caphidera, which include the lovely guinea pigs, which are very commonly kept as pets. They're, and I'm sure I'll get this one wrong, <laughs> they're Irigsantindera. <laughs> These include the porcupine and the chinchadera, which, no guesses for this one, includes the lovely chinchilla, which are also kept as pets. These make up the Daegu's close relatives. Included in these groups are also the capybara, the yellow toothed cavi, and the mara. In total, there are 230 species in this order. Some of their really close relatives are within the Octonara family. As well as the four subspecies of Daegu's, there are rock rabbits, the Tuka Tuka, the Katugara, the white faced tree rat, the Nichira, the Cuban Hitara, and the Mountain Fisker. And as you can see from the pictures, many of these share physical characteristics similar with Daegu's, and you can see how they are all related. So, let's take a little closer look at Daegu anatomy. So, as I said in the intro, Daegus are normally between 12 to 16 centimetres in length with a 10 to 14 centimetre tail which is slightly smaller than their body. I always say that they're between the size of a gerbil and a rat. I also like to say they look a bit like a squirrel but without the fluffy tail. They weigh between 170 to 300 grams but most are in the mid 200s. Then this does vary as you do get some little Daegus and some who are a bit chunky. Saying no names, Miss Tina. Their tails are covered in short bristle-like hairs with longer bristles extending out at the back. They have large head with larger eyes, moderate sized ears and orange teeth. They have shortest soft fur and overall they are adorable creatures. Teeth. Daegus have 20 teeth. Two pairs of incisors, 
two pairs of premolars and six pairs of molars. Davies are prone to dental issues. Like many rodents, their teeth continuously grow, so it is important that they have lots of stuff to gnaw on, as well as a good supply of hay to keep those teeth worn down. Any signs of dental issues and you should take your baby straight to the vet. The front incisors should appear slightly longer than the bottom and be slightly more protruding. Most important thing about daigu teeth is that they should always be orange. It is actually the enamel of the daigu teeth which gives them this orange colour and the exact process of what causes this isn't actually known. However, it seems to be very much linked to daigu nutrition and what they're taking in the diet. This is either through enzymes in their saliva or through protein synthesis. However, white teeth and day juice is a sign of nutrition deficiency and once again you should take your day juice to the vets. Eyes, typically black in colour and a gooty is always having this really cute little lighter ring around their eyes which is completely adorable. They actually have really good vision and they can see both green light and UV. This is actually uncommon for mammals to be able to see UV light and it's actually through testing that they've been shown that daigus can distinguish between UV light and visible light. Daigus can develop cataracts so it's really important to keep an eye on your daigus eyes no pun intended and any cloudiness or anything like that please do take them to the vet as cataracts can be a sign of diabetes in daigus which they are very prone to. The Davies eyes are positioned to the side of the head and this gives them a great range of vision. Ears. Davies have well developed ears which are kind of moderate sized compared to their heads. So their ears have no fur on the outer edges. However inside the ear canal it is protected by little hairs. And these hairs are quite coarse. And this just protects the Davies hearings. The ears are shaped to help capture sound and this gives they use great hearing. And this is really important in the wild as one of their main predators in the wild are birds. So of course this lets them hear them up above and hopefully stops them becoming the bird's snack. In captivity, this helps them distinguish when you're opening the treat jar. The lack of fur and the thinness of ears also helps them thermoregulate and dissipate body heat. And this is great in warmer climates, such as Central Chile, where they're naturally from. Noses and whiskers. Daigus have small little noses surrounded by beautiful long whiskers. The whiskers are very sensitive to touch stimuli, and these are used as a sensory mechanism, and this gives daigus great spatial awareness. Coats. Daigus have soft, short coats, covering their entire bodies, legs and tail. So typically the wild daigus are all agouti in colour and this is a sort of medium brown colour although the exact shade does vary with a lighter belly. So originally this was really the only colour available as it's their natural colour and the only one known in the wild. However more recently different colour coats have been bred and you can now get a whole range. So nowadays some of the coat variations include blue. These have a sort of grey blue colour. Champagne, so these are actually agouti or blue daigus, but the base shaft of the fur is cream coloured. Black daigus, these are actually all dark brown, a very very dark brown and they appear black to us. And the hair shaft is completely black with no other banding. Sand daigus have a sandy ginger coloured coat. Cream coloured Daigus are actually a lighter form of the sand daigu. However, these are quite rare to be produced because this is actually a sand and a blue together, but it's typically only the second generation of pups that will show this coat. So it is quite a rare colour. White daigus. So it's actually debatable about whether true white daigus have been produced or whether this is actually just a super expression of the pied or white patch gene. So there are no known albino daigus, albino meaning a lack of pigmentation altogether. So they would be completely white with pink skin and also red eyes. This could mean that any such 
albinosin would be lethal in day use as it is in some animals. It would depend where the gene for albinosin is located, but this is a possibility. Now, there have been some dagus produced which do appear to be entirely white. So, this is one of my white dagus. So, I had four of these of someone who imported them from Germany. Two boys, two girls who were kept separately. However, two weeks after getting them, I had some more as eight pups were born. So, out of the eight pups, interestingly, five were white and three were agouti, although they did appear alike to agouti. So as you can see, the white dogies seem to have a completely white coat. Their skin and tails appear to be a sort of pinky colour, or they do have black patches on their ears. However, they do have black eyes. So this would mean it is not albino. Now, possibly as they get older, their coats might change. This might actually tell me a bit about whether they are true whites or whether they are super pies. So until we do more genetics on ones like these, we won't actually know if this is a true coat variation or just a super expression of the pied. Interestingly enough, when I was discussing this online with other people, someone did mention about leucristic in snakes and reptiles, which is when the snake is not albino, but it is all white with no pattern. So, potentially, could it be something like that? Completely unknown. Perhaps in the future people do more research on these and we'll find out whether it's its own coat colour variation or whether they're super pieds. Either way, I think they are completely adorable. Finally, we have pied or white patched dagoos. So, these are dagoos of any colour, so a gooty, blue, black, cream, sand, any of them, can also be mixed with a pied. And a pied gene means they have white patches over their body. And these can go from small tiny white patches to being almost entirely white. Male or female. Both male and female actually have really similar downstairs anatomy. And this has led to a lot of misgendering, especially by pet shops and bad breeders. And this has led to a lot of accidental dagoes which do not have great genetics. However, it is actually quite easy to learn how to gender a dagu. So, in simple terms, the main external difference between a male and a female is the gap between the ureta and the anus. In even simpler terms, if there's a gap, it's a chap. So this is what I learnt after I rehomed two boys off Facebook. So I had two boys ready, decided to get two more. So at this point I was quite new to Daegu's, so after introducing them they all went really well. One was starting to get a little fat but I didn't think much of it. And then I came home from a night shift to find babies. And it turns out the two new boys I'd got had actually both been girls. But after this I learnt how to gender Daegu's. I successfully gendered all the pups and I've since gendered many more. As some of the recipes I've taken in have been different to what has been stated. I haven't ever misgendered a daegu, so it is really simple to learn. So, I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit more about these absolutely adorable creatures. Part 3 of my daegu care series, Daegu on a Diet, will be coming soon. So please like, follow and subscribe if you'd like to keep up to date with the Jungle Gang and all my lovely goos. But for now, it's bye from me and bye from my lovely goos. Bye bye!